Chapter 2 As I predicted, in so little time, so much has changed. Perhaps Berry Blue was referring to her hairdo, woven with leaves to make her look like a, a forest nymph. Now the Walpoles were on the TV screen, and they didn't cut as pretty a picture. Mrs. Walpole had just emitted a blood-curdling cry that shook the forest to its roots after a spider had used her hand as a landing pad. "'We need a fire to keep the creepy crawlies away!' said Mr. Walpole frantically. Oliver inhaled deeply. "'Dad, the matches are all wet!' "'Oh, great, let's play the blame game,' said Harvey Walpole. "'Your mother was half-drowning in the waves, and you wanted me to think about matches!' The water, the water they'd waded through to come ashore had only been knee-deep, but Oliver bit his lip. This was probably not the best time to make a, make a point. "'It's too sticky for a fire anyway,' said Mrs. Walpole, lifting one perfectly arched eyebrow, "'and it makes my hair frizz!' Oliver said nothing. He was looking at the jungle canopy towering above them like a thirty-story building. Up! It seemed the only way to escape a forest floor teeming with bugs was to go up, but the thought of it made him a little light-headed. He stared out at the buttress roots, propping up the tallest trees and masses of vines and creepers that looked like spaghetti. A buttress is a support of some sort, so what they mean here is saying that the roots are helping keep those trees standing tall. The thought of food made Oliver's stomach rumble. The creepers weren't for eating, but they were as thick as a man's arm, twisting and twinning up to the sun. Maybe they had other uses. Let's make a camp, he shouted. We can cut these creepers and build somewhere to sleep. I'll handle that, said Mr. Walpole gallantly, and Oliver heaved an inward sigh of relief. The family spat had been postponed. Well, at least for now. Mr. Garcia was also looking up, which explained why his foot got caught in a mess of tangled roots. His ankle throbbed painfully, but his heart jumped. Water, food, fuel, shelter, this was it! Coconut palm, said Gabriella, feeling thankful for these drift seeds that had traveled across oceans and on currents to take root on this remote island. She shot her father a worried look as he extricated his foot, wincing. Are you okay, Papa? He nodded, although a red-hot flash of pain surged through his leg as they trudged forward, the mud clenching around their feet. The tide was coming in faster than they'd expected, submerging their swampy jetty and threatening to overcome them. They've mentioned the tide a couple times here. So the tide is when the sea rises and falls throughout the day. Um, That's usually due to the sun and the moon affecting the water levels. So right now the tide is getting higher, meaning the water levels are growing. Sprained ankle or not, they would have to keep moving, even if every movement was excruciatingly slow. They clambered to dry land as the tide rose higher. We'll splash palm leaves together for our shelter here, said Gabriella, recalling all of the survival adventures she'd watched on TV and read about in books. They made it look so easy. Save some palm fronds from the ground to insulate us, she said, and saw the agreement on her father's face. Then he looked away. Gabriella's father had never stepped out of the little town where he was born, and now they were in a mangrove swamp. There would be rising tides and hungry crocodiles, as well as leeches and snakes that she hoped the palm fronds would protect them from. Gabriella was glad she didn't have to spell it out for him. The Leus weren't having it easy either. There was only enough bread, cheese, and raisins to last one whole day if they ate frugally, meaning if they didn't eat very much. The temperature had dropped noticeably, and the wind whistled like a banshee. Mrs. Leus' teeth were chattering already. Look, warm, she stuttered, still sparing a frozen smile for the cameras. Mr. Leus' speech was slurred. No animal can survive this... The twins exchanged looks, early signs of hypothermia. They had to find shelter, and fast. Hypothermia is when you get too cold, um, and so your body begins to shut down. Shen's thoughts were wandering again. How did animals survive in this windy wasteland of grass and rock? Gelada baboons, said May, reading Shen's thoughts as always. 
Didn't these primates of the Ethiopian highlands escape their windswept habitat by climbing down steep cliff faces at nightfall and roosting in the ledges? The minutes were slipping away as fast as their body heat now, and Shen knew the cold, thin air was making it hard for him to think. Follow us, Shen cried out to his parents. May was pulling the tarps out of their bags, her hands fumbling at the zipper. Shen had a plan now, but he needed a tree for this to work and there were no trees so far above the tree line. Could he use a rock, maybe? Or three? An outcrop of three rocks. Now that would work. Dizzy now, Shen felt the wind stinging his eyes as he peered over the edge of the mountain to look at a narrow sill only a few feet down. It would have to do. It would do. It would have to. Now isn't that ingenious? Very blue, in army fatigues now, was clapping. The Liu's were tucked inside two large tar hammocks slung over the cliff moored by the rocks. Below them, a tiny ledge stood between them and nothingness. I have to say, I'd be very scared to do something like that. There's always a solution to every problem, Barry Blue said, cocking her head thoughtfully to one side. The Garcias were crawling into their palm leaf shelter, and the wall poles were already inside what appeared to be a large cross frame made of creepers suspended above the ground. So safe, so sound, said Barry Blue, pretending to yawn and hugging her heart-shaped pillow. Good night, and oh, sleep tight.